the last eight and a half miles. And I said, well, if you come back and you get permission and you want somebody to walk with you, I'll walk with you. Oh, that was great, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Okay. I'll keep in touch with you. Well, he called me about three weeks ago and he said, you know what? I've just been to the doctor's and I've been diagnosed with AFib. Anybody here know what AFib? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, he said, and so I, I guess I'm not going to be able to do it. So it was... Uh, it was disappointing because I was hoping I'd be able to, because he always felt bad that he had to drop out of the race. Not that he was going to win, but um, there's a certain amount of accomplishment that you run the whole 26.2 miles. So I had been thinking that I would get him a bib, you know, a number so that he would, that he could wear saying 191968, 1968. No, start it, start it, 1968, finishing 2023. It'd be a nice bib, wouldn't it? 55 years to run a marathon or to finish a marathon. 50, that's a long, that's a long marathon. Well, you know, um, some of you can identify with this when you were a little girl or a little boy. You heard the preacher stand up and say, Jesus is coming soon. And you believed it. And now here you are, probably maybe in excess of 50 or 60 years of age, and say, wow, I never thought I'd live to this age, and Jesus wouldn't have been back. Well, that's happened to thousands and tens of thousands of Seventh-day Adventists uh, for over four or five generations. We're still here, 2023. How much longer? How much longer? Now, when we, when we, I say we, when we typically talk about how Jesus is coming soon, we use negative signs. The world's getting wicked. Look what's going on in, in the political arena. Look at all the terrible weather, you know, all the earthquakes and all that. We, we think of the negative when we think about Jesus coming soon. And we don't very often think of the positive. As I quoted this morning, from Matthew 24, 14, for this gospel of the kingdom. What is the gospel again? It's what? Good news. And we rarely think about good news when we think that Jesus is coming soon. It's usually how wicked the world is getting, the earthquakes, all those kinds of things, et cetera, et cetera. So okay. So, um, listen, <laughs> getting ahead of me a little bit. That's okay. So, uh, a number of years ago, probably about 30 years ago, I was sitting at camp meeting in South Lancaster. And there was someone speaking. And if I told you the name, some of you would remember the individual. And he said, I don't care when Jesus returns. I winced a little bit when I heard it. Well, it might not be any care of his, but I can tell you, based upon this, the, the, the overwhelming evidence of Scripture, it makes a big difference to Jesus. Fact is that God is hurting. He's hurting. We're told that every sin brings pain to the heart of God. Every sin brings pain to the heart of God. So if I care about God, if I care about God, then I would want to help, want to help bring his hurt to an end. Bring his pain. You love somebody, you love somebody and they're hurting. You want to help relieve their hurt, don't you? You do. If it's a spouse, or it's a child, it's what you know, a neighbor, or whatever, a friend. You want that to be able to come to an end soon. And so, today, I want to talk some about the faith of Jesus, because doesn't it say someplace in the Bible? I can't quite remember where. Wink, wink. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the. the 
faith of Jesus. Is that where it is? Revelation. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, the faith of Jesus. What is that all about, the faith of Jesus? The Lord wants to come very, very soon. I have no doubt about that in my mind. He wants to come soon. He wants to come soon so that our heartaches can stop, right? Our heartaches, our disappointments, our hurts can be a thing of the past. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you're just a very wonderful personal God. You're not somebody who's far away. No, you're right beside us. But you'd like to be as close to us as you possibly can. That's the way it is when two persons are in love. They want to be close to one another. We thank you that that's your, that's your MO. That's what you're like. May that make a difference in our thinking. And uh, may we see some things today perhaps we hadn't seen before. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to go to the screen. Remember now, I got you back here because you felt enticed to return because I was going to share with you that God may be smarter than you think. I can't say what his IQ is, but it must be pretty high. And we're going to see something this afternoon that helps us to understand just how smart God is. All right, so we're going to go to the screen. I think we're going to go to the screen. Is my friend up there that's working on the screen? Uh-oh. He was there. Ah, uh, hello. Yeah, if there's two of them going, he's in trouble with two of them going out there. I'll tell you that much. Oh. Here we go. Here we go. Now, I think most of you recognize this, don't you? Well, what is it? It's a map of the United States. That's right. It's a map of the United States and even has Alaska and I guess Hawaii is there, although I'm not. Uh... Anyway, so here, here it is. Now, I'm going to tell you something that you may not know. Maybe you do. There are some places in the United States that have a great deal of influence. In the United States. But not just in the United States, there is areas in this country that have influence, a great deal of influence, a great deal of influence around the entire world. And I'm going to mention those places to you and to tell you that one of those places is on the West Coast that has tremendous influence all over the world. Where do you think it would be? I heard it, Hollywood. The only place that can compete with where I'm going to show you on the next slide is, because where I'm going to show you on the next slide has great influence all over the world. Could we have the next slide? Now, there is a corridor called a megalopolis. And that corridor, that megalopolis, extends from Washington, D.C., up through New York City to a place you all live near called Boston, Massachusetts. That corridor 
has more influence in the world than any other megalopolis on planet Earth. I'll tell you why, if you're, if you're not sure. Washington, D.C. is obvious, right? What happens in Washington, D.C. as far as politics towards go government has an effect all over the world. Washington, D.C. is the premier center of, of leadership as far as the world turns. Even more than the Vatican. But we're talking here about a megalopolis. So if you've traveled at all on the east, up and down the East Coast, like Route 95, that my wife and I travel a couple of times a year, going back and forth to Mississippi and, and Florida, et cetera. So as you travel, you, you recognize that it is a megalopolis. There's hardly any country between New York and Washington, D.C. So why is New York a leadership around the world? One thing, Wall Street, right? Business. It it's the leader in all the world. But you don't stop there because you go up to this other place called Beantown, otherwise known as Boston, Massachusetts. Now, what makes Boston in the same category as Washington, D.C. and New York City? education. There is one institution here in the Boston community that has graduated seven U.S. presidents. No other institution can make that kind of a brag. Called what? Harvard. That's right. And I could tell you stories about Harvard that would make you smile, but I don't think I have time this afternoon about my rubbing elbows with certain individuals there. But anyway, Harvard, not just Harvard, MIT. And shall we say BU as well? <laughs> but it, 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 it has tremendous education and, and its hospitals are, are world renowned, right? Yeah. So it has because of its educational institutions, a tremendous influence. Kings and future kings and queens graduate from institutions in Boston, especially Harvard or perhaps MIT. Tremendous influence. So now let's just pretend we're God. Not irreverently, but let's just pretend we're God. And we know that in the 21st century, this corridor is going to have more influence in the world than any other corridor on planet Earth. It's the 1800s. And we say, well, you know what? I think what we should do, we're talking here now to the Godhead, the rest of the God, of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and I'll, maybe the angels in on it too. Where would it be good to plant a church? And so, well, North Dakota? Well, mm, um, Iowa? <clears throat> Sorry. Iowa? Why don't we, if we want to have a lot of influence upon the influencers, probably a good idea to begin a denomination where? In Maine or New England and New York. That's where the early pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church were. New York, New England. That's not dumb. And oh, yes, by the way, we'll work on something so that eventually there'll be a congregation in a place called Fort, 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 Framingham because it's right near Boston. You're not here by accident. You are not here by, 
This congregation does not exist by accident. You, you, are you listening? You have tremendous opportunities of influence upon the influencers, the influencers of this corridor. It reverberates all over the world. God, God's smart. He didn't, he didn't create a denomination called Seventh the Adventist in North Dakota. Not that he didn't like the people in North Dakota, but he's trying to be as effective as he possibly can to end this whole thing called the great controversy, the cosmic conflict. Never underestimate, if you live in this area, how important you are to God. He's got bigger plans for you than you realize. And the thing is, do you realize that? Now, with all due respect, by the way, my friend who didn't finish the marathon, I think he was from North Carolina, North Dakota. With all due respect to the people there, do all due respect to the people in Iowa. <laughs> um, we have somebody from Iowa here. Um, God loves all of them as well, but he had a reason to start here. He knew that this area of the world was going to be very influential in the closing hours of Earth's history. Do you see that? Do you realize God might be smarter than you realized? His IQ is going to be at least three or 400, wouldn't you say? <laughs> So, what is it? I was I was out yard sailing. I'm I'm a crazy guy. I like the yard sale. Okay, I well, I don't love yard sailing. I, I like the yard sale. And I when I'm in Florida, where we're there in November and also in March, my daughter, my daughter goes yard sailing every Friday morning. In Florida, they have yard sailing Fridays and Saturdays. Sundays, they don't because most of them are in church. It's the Bible Belt, after all. So we go on a Friday morning. Now, my daughter goes, she goes religiously. She goes religiously. And the reason she goes yard sailing is because, and she takes her little cell phone with her. She sees an item. She looks it up. Oh, they're selling that for $3, and I know I can get $20 on Craigslist for it. She buys it. She donates the money to the local Pathfinder Club. Doesn't keep it for herself. She donates the money to the Pathfinder Club. So I go yard sailing because I like to look for old books. I love to get my hands on books. So about a month ago, we were yard sailing. And as I, am I, am I boring you yet? Okay, all right, keep going. So I, I spot it a little pamphlet at this yard sale. I'm around Orlando, Florida. And I say, hmm, little pamphlet. And it's a religious pamphlet. I say, hmm. In the meantime, while I'm looking at this pamphlet the person has, and has several pamphlets out there on display in our, in our, in our driveway, I noticed that down the driveway a little bit, she is trying to give one of these pamphlets to my granddaughter, my 13-year-old granddaughter. So after she's done unsuccessfully of trying to give this to my granddaughter, um, I speak to her and I say, I'm curious to know what denomination you represent. Now, I know. I know what denomination she represents. And immediately, she starts trying to argue with me. And I'm kind of taken aback. And she is going for the juggler. And if somebody goes for your juggler, you're in trouble. Well, not like they're going for your foot or whatever. And she just is mm, like a buzzsaw. And I try to I try to diffuse the thing and, and wanting her to realize I was a friend, not somebody who was going to there stand there and argue with her. 
but she just argued she wanted to oh and she was giving all kinds of things to me in terms of verbally why her church was the true church i didn't say anything and you know you can't argue somebody into the truth you realize that do you now, if you realize that, you are smarter than 98% of Seventh-day Adventists. And I know you said yes, but if you're like I am at some point in time, you've made the mistake of trying to argue truth with someone. Especially when it comes to the Sabbath, state of the dead, or something like that, right? And so she, I'm thinking to myself, what does she think she's going to really do but that that's the mentality it seems of a lot of persons who belong to that particular denomination argue do you know what the greatest argument is there is an argument by the way that is more effective than anything else the greatest argument we're told for the gospel is a loving and lovable christian So we, we, I'm saying we, we need to remember that when we get into discussions or debates with people about things from the scriptures. That just is not the way to go about it. That's especially true of the Z, Generation Z, right? Generation Z, they're not looking for somebody to convince them of the truth. Not at all. In fact, it turns them off. And it even turns off some Generation Z that are inside Seventh-day Adventist Church. And some of them are leaving in droves. We have a big challenge on our hands, a huge challenge of retaining our Generation Z members. And Generation Z is what, 16 to 30 or something like that? So what can we do? What can we do? My third and last slide. Of all professing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. There's a lot of different denominations, but it says of all, of all people, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Jesus before the world. Now you say, oh, blah, blah. but you know what? There's a lot of false Christ floating around. There's a lot of false Christ floating around. There's only one true Christ, and do you know where he is? He's in the most holy place, of the heavenly sanctuary. Not in the holy place, not in the courtyard, not in the entrance, but in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary as our great high priest. You know, the rabbis, maybe I mentioned this before, the rabbis, even to this day, some rabbis have this particular expression. The holy place the holy place, is the engagement room. You know, before you get married, you're engaged, right? The most holy place is the marriage room. And it's in the marriage room that you become exceedingly intimate. They would call it the wedding room or the marriage room, the most holy place. And so what is there about Jesus that can be the instrument of overcoming all of either the preconceived ideas or what we would call a secular atmosphere? You may be aware that in the last least a decade or two, they take surveys every year, but the Pew Foundation does, to determine what areas of the United States are the most receptive 
to spiritual things and which part of the country is the most disinterested in anything to do with spiritual matters. And I haven't seen the part where, you know, they're most receptive, but I think we can guess. It's in the Bible Belt. You go south and uh, nobody thinks you're crazy if you bow your head in a restaurant and have grace before you eat. Here, if you opened one eye while you were praying and looked around, you'd see some people looking at you as if, what are you doing? So in, in, uh, in the Northeast here, Northeast, not Oregon, not California, not Washington State, habitually every year, the area of the country that is the most disinterested in spiritual things is New England or parts of New England. One year, it could be from Fall River to Providence. Another year, it could be Worcester to whatever, or some year, it could be Maine, but it's here. And people, as I think you know, I don't have to tell you this, are very little interested in anything that has to do with spiritual matters. That's a challenge. Now, somebody, somebody can, they can worship the New England Patriots, but they don't worship anything else. They can worship video games. But they can't worship on Sabbath, not even Sunday. They can worship entertainment, but they have no interest at all in somebody introducing them to the message of the Bible. They can be interested in money and getting ahead, becoming multi, multi millionaires or even billionaires. But they have no interest in hearing about the riches of heaven. And so the challenge is a great one. Because probably your neighbors, or at least a good majority of them, they never go to church. They never get involved with anything that has religion hooked onto it. And so how do you how do you have them become interested? Because I'm I would imagine you care. You 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 like to share your faith. You like to share with people what you have. Because you love what you have. That that what you have is Jesus. But how to approach individuals, how to get through to all of that. Well, let's go to scripture. Look at a couple of things in scripture. Let's, first of all, go to Revelation chapter 14. And I think you, especially after Sabbath school today and this past week, the Sabbath school lesson that uh, as we mentioned, Revelation 14, you perhaps have memorized the three angels' messages. And it, it tells us in verse 11, well, let's look at verse, uh, go back to verse, uh, verse 9. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice what kind of a voice a loud voice bone there is a, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand he himself all shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of god which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. By the way, notice it says about these people that they have no rest day or night. When is that? When would they experience that? Have no rest day or night. Anybody? 
the time. Sabbath is good to God. You know, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there is a trend today within our ranks of doing away with the holiness of the Sabbath. And you could talk about that till the cows come home, I recognize. But it's people who do not have Jesus, who have not who have not entered into the rest that Jesus offers, right? Come unto me, all you that what? Labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So that that restlessness begins long before. Long before the mark of the beast. And again, we talk a lot about the mark of the beast, but we should also be talking about the seal of God, right? Which is the seventh day Sabbath. Let me give you a food for thought. And I don't want to be sound too legalistic here. Have you ever, have you ever said on a Friday afternoon, an hour before sunset, or Friday, an hour before sunset, boy, am I thankful for the Sabbath. It's been a, it's been a tiring week. Now, if you've never said that, you are ready for translation. You are ready. You, in fact, right now, you may disappear from the rest of us. You may be raptured off the heaven. Wink, wink. I'm kidding now, of course. But, but do you know, there is something about entering into the Sabbath full of joy and happiness and feeling fresh. And I think that's what he wants for us because what would you think, ladies, what would you think if you dated a guy, you know, you're not married, you dated a guy, and every time he went out on a date with you, all he did was sleep. Would, would you be impressed? Probably not. Say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No. You, you. <laughs> so when Sabbath comes and we're looking forward to, man, it's been a hard week. And that happens. We all have hard weeks so, from time to time. But there's something about coming fresh and excited about the Sabbath because it's going to be a great day with you and the Lord. And it's when one is living righteously by faith that that becomes a reality. That the Sabbath comes so wonderfully to you, not because now you're going to be able to get some extra sleep. And you don't have to, you know, be stressed out all the time. No, it's because of the great joy you're going to experience in being with Jesus. Is that the way the Sabbath is to you? That's all I'm getting. Judy, the only one I'm getting through with me is you. That's the way that's the way Jesus wants the Sabbath to be. And if you're living righteously by faith, you won't see it just simply as a day that you can put up your feet and relax and fall asleep at you know 7:30 at night. And oh my, I hope the pastor doesn't go overtime because I gotta get some sleep around one o'clock, one thirty in the afternoon. And I'll wake up just, to, just before the sun sets and say, what are we doing tonight, you know? Now, if, if you've never had that happen again, you are ready for, you are ready for a rapture. You are ready for see <laughs> anyway. But the Sabbath is the culmination of a living righteously by faith every day. Of the week. It's the climax. It's the frosting on the cake. It's the, and, and, and I don't know, but the older I get, and you look at me, I ain't no spring chicken. I ain't no spring chicken. The more and more I hate to see the Sabbath in. And that's why the, the day of the week that I don't like the most, is that a double negative? I don't know. 
is Sunday. Because I realize I'm still six days away from the Sabbath. That seems like a long time at times. So God is giving us a day of rest that represents the rest we have in him the other six days. Do you follow me? That's one of the great values of the Sabbath. It regenerates, does it not? It regenerates. And, and let me say this too about the Sabbath. It's a, it's a gift. It's going to become more and more important. By the way, would you have, would you like, now be honest with yourself, be honest with me as I look out at you. Do you wish there was a text in the New Testament that said the seventh day is the Sabbath? It always has been and always will be. That would cut out all this. Well, you know, well, uh, you know, can you show me from the New Testament? Blah, 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 blah. You know, three. Wouldn't you like a text like that? Well, why didn't God give it to you? <laughs> I know. He did. Because he's smarter than we are. I've discovered that. You, if, you, if you're working, if you're in a battle or in a war with the devil, you're wanting to outsmart him. Aren't you? Oh, you mean the Lord can't outsmart the devil? Well, you know, as I say, but you, if you're in a battle and you're God, I should have said that, you, you outsmart. And where he thought, where the devil thought it was God's great weakness was actually a strong point. He wants the controversy to end over that particular day because it represents salvation by faith alone. It's a great symbol of salvation. Remember how the, and I, I, I guess I'm going on here. How, how, how is the, the fourth commandment? It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Blah, 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 blah. For in six days, the what? Lord made what? And earth, the sea, and all that in there is, right? And west of the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. How does it go in the commandments in the book of Deuteronomy? Maybe, Dr. Jackson, you can read it to us from chapter five of Deuteronomy. Listen to how you know you know how it is in Deuteronomy. Not the same. It's not the same. Go ahead. different, isn't it? Because the one in Exodus reminds you that God is what? Creator. The one in Deuteronomy reminds you that God is Savior. That's not an accident. God's he's smarter than we are. No. What he's telling us that every Sabbath we can remember that we are twice his. By creation, by redemption. That's how important we are to him, or twice is. And, and the, the, the Sabbath has got gospel written all over it. The gospel is in the gospel. The gospel is in the Ten Commandments. Do you realize that? The gospel is in the Ten Commandments. And one of the little things you, you hear and is that <clears throat> pay your tithe. And if you pay your tithe, you're going to be blessed. Is that true? Okay. I agree. But it's not that you're going to be blessed. The blessing begins when you pay your tithe. It's not you pay your tithe and later on you're going to get a blessing. 
that's separating that that's what we call spiritualism you're you're separating those two things no the blessing is in the giving of the tithe because you are acting other centered you are acting other centered you're uh, you you are acting in love in agape so you're being other centered there's a blessing in being other centered it isn't that i do this and oh yeah um I, I, i'm going to win the lottery next week the joy is not in getting the blessing the joy is in the giving and that's the blessing do you follow me don't separate those two things not at all so well i don't have my what time is it i 317? Oh, no. This is just the introduction, by the way. <laughs> you know what? The good news is better than we think, isn't it? The good news is better than we think. The name of a book, by the way. So back to chapter 14 and says, and after describing all these individuals who have received the mark of the beast, and, and I know it's not, it's not consistent with the way the greek runs but i'll i'll be a little I'll, I'll i'll be liberal here here is the patience of the saints here's god saying oh and, and over here over here though all those people who are suffering because they are worshiping the beast and its image and receiving the mark over here look, look, look. over here there's a group there that keep the commandments of god to have the faith in Jesus. And if you don't know it throughout the universe, listen up just for a second. All of you out there on those other planets or wherever you are that are doing something, hold off just a second. I have an announcement to make to you. This is God speaking. Those individuals down there, you know, the ones that are keeping the commandments, and don't get legalistic when we talk that way. Keeping the commandments has nothing to do with legalism. And, and, and the faith of Jesus? I want you to know that they're my trump card. Those, those people who are members of the Framingham Center Seventh-day Adventist Church, all of you out there in the universe, I want you to know that there's some of my Trump coming. Because Romans tells us, doesn't it, that God's on trial. I don't know of any denomination, any other denomination that understands that as some of the Adventists do. Don't underestimate the great theme of the cosmic conflict because most other denominations are so ego-centered that they don't understand their role in the great controversy. The good news is that it's not about us, it's about him. That's the faith of Jesus. That's the faith of Jesus. It's a faith that is centered in the other, that says, God, your ultimate concern was not what was going to happen to you, but what was going to happen to us. That was Jesus' great statement on the cross of Calvary. What happens to me, Father, is secondary to what happens to the people in Framingham and all the other places on planet Earth. Their existence is even more important to me than my own. When you and I have that kind of faith, when we allow God to give it to us, there's going to come a roll of thunder, a little small cloud in the eastern sky, Jesus will be coming.
It's not about us. It's about him. And my ultimate goal is not to get to heaven. My ultimate goal is to honor and glorify Jesus. Heaven is the frosting on the cake. And it's my belief that when Jesus has a people who think like that, they're ready for him to come. Would you like to be one of those people? I tell you, friends, nobody can produce revival. Nobody can reform themselves. No one can repent. It's a gift. Every single one of those is a gift. Revival, reformation, repentance, they're all a gift from God. And he's looking. His eyes running to and fro on the earth. And with his son and with the Holy Spirit, looking, looking, looking for anybody who will allow them to be given that kind of faith. And friends, it's a working faith. That kind of faith just suddenly gives you a burden for other people. I appreciated the fact that Mark Finley, who is the editor or whatever of the of Sabbath School Quarterly, what day was it Wednesday? There's a bigger thing. There's a bigger issue, right? What, uh, uh, well, how does it go again? What was the title on Wednesday or Thursday? Yes, that's it. What was it again? Part of something bigger than ourselves. I like that. And I'll confess to you, I haven't always been that kind of a person. I'll confess to you, I've let the Lord down many times. No, I didn't cheat on my wife. No, I didn't. I wasn't drinking booze on the side. No, I blah, 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 blah. blah. Come on now. None of us can claim that we've been perfect, right? But I want to be that kind of person says, Lord, I'd really like that kind of faith. That kind of faith that just loves to share you by word and by deed to others. It can happen. Not only in your life, but in the life of whatever church you belong to. Happen. And I am wanting to share with you God is anxious to find people who are willing to let it happen in their lives. So, yes, my time with you has come to a close. You've been a very kind week to let me come and uh, pray. Pray. You may be aware that in the last couple of months, something that hadn't happened for 50 years happened. That was back in 1973, a revival broke out on a place called Asbury University, Kentucky. And that revival swept all across the United States. You may be aware, about two months ago, in 1973, and I mean 2023, a revival has again broken out on the Asbury University campus. And that revival that was going on there went 24 7 for several weeks without stopping. That's right. The church was open 24 hours a day, every day of the week, 
over probably about six weeks. It just it just closed in the last two or three weeks because the university authority said we got to stop because there are a lot of people by the thousands coming on campus that are not students and uh, it's getting so that we can't control them anymore. But I remember about that same time and I'm really old and my wife, oh, well, she's not as old as I am, but you know, there's a revival that broke out on 7th Avenue's campuses. In 1973-74, it happened right here at Atlantic Union College. Students were meeting together, praying together, staying up late at night in their dormitories, reading the Bible, studying, praying, praying with one another on the sidewalks of the campus, all over the place. They were rejoicing in the Lord. And that revival swept across college campuses all over North America, Seventh-day Adventists, and churches. And tens of thousands of Seventh-day Adventists can still trace their revival to what happened in those years, 50 years ago. My wife is one. Maybe some of you have been Seventh-day Adventists for longer than that. And remember, it, it happened. My burden that would happen. You've heard me say before, I think God has a soft spot in his heart because this is where his bride, his final bride, was born. So today we'll close off and maybe we can kneel and uh, if you can and maybe few of you could pray out loud and I'll close off, okay? Let's just pray that we allow God to have his way in our hearts as never before. If you're going to pray, pray loudly uh, if you would and I will close off.
we thank you for goodness that can lead us to repentance. And Father, we we seek your forgiveness. We have kept you waiting far longer than what we should have. We thank you that you're a forgiving God and that you're a forgetting God too at times. And so we know you sent Jesus to lead us to repentance. Not just once, Lord, but that we would have an attitude of repentance, of turning away from those things which are trivial and turning to you to those things that are of such great importance. And this little speck in your vast universe is commanding your attention. And it's more important to you, we read, than anything else, because it's the only little rebellious part of your vast universe. And you are hoping. And that's why you gave us, us a future and a hope that we will say yes to you and allow you to willing to do of your good pleasure in and through us. We're only small little people, just small little people. But oh, by the power of that gospel, through the strength of the Holy Spirit, in the matchless charms of your grace, we can be someone that you can use to your glory. We yearn for it, Lord, but we want to learn yearn even more for it. May we hunger and thirst for you. May we not be satisfied with what we know. But may we seek in an intimate environment to know you more wonderfully so that we have all the more reason for not containing ourselves and being, not just saying, but being a merciful, gracious, just, kind person. May you give this congregation, Lord, wisdom from on high. May they seek that from you. May it not just be as it has always been. May they be filled with your spirit so wonderfully that they say as a church, what can we allow you to happen through us so that this community will be exposed to your righteousness and your goodness as never before. May they build upon what they've done over the last several decades and actually since its inception here. They're not here by accident. Not at all. Not a coincidence. They're here to make a difference. And they're in a place where they can make a greater difference on the world than someone living in Nepal or wherever. So, Father, thank you for being so good. And uh, may we all, no matter what congregation we represent today, may it be in our desire, our hearts, reflect you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.